turn uh, over the program uh, to our final uh, panel led by Mark Tony, uh, who is the executive director of the Utility Reform Network in San Francisco. And most importantly, from my perspective, uh, one of the members of the board of directors of the National Whistleblower Center. And Mark will uh, lead us on the panel of uh, tools for whistleblowers. Thank you very much, John. I, I am just incredibly privileged to introduce a group of outstanding panelists who are here to talk about the system of laws and tools that protect whistleblowers as they put their reputations, their careers, and sometimes their very lives on the line. As they speak out, to expose police misconduct, racial violence, misspending of COVID relief funds, and deceptive climate changes that they have witnessed with their very own eyes. Each speaker will make a three minute introductory statement, after which we will entertain about 10 minutes of questions and answers afterwards, uh, given that we have enough time. So the first panelist I'd like to introduce is Robert Jackson. Welcome, Robert. Uh, Robert is professor of law and co-director of the Institute for Corporate Governance and Finance at the New York University School of Law and former commissioner of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Robert. It's all yours. Well, thank you so much uh, for that very kind introduction. And I'm delighted to be here. Um, and um, I don't know about all of you, but I've learned so much from all of the conversations today in the, in the previous uh, panel in particular. So what I'll do is be brief. Um, I'm also, I had the great privilege of being on with panelists who have behind the scenes been fighting with and for whistleblowers for many, many years. So I'm gonna um, just briefly give um, my high level uh, introductory thoughts and then um, um, hand it back to you, Mark, for conversation with my colleagues. Um, it is crucial that everybody who um, works with, advises and understands the process that a whistleblower goes through has at their disposal um, uh, the tools and options that um, uh, the whistleblower protection laws that we have in the United States, um, in particular at the Securities and Exchange Commission, um, um, uh, give to those who, as Mark says, are putting their livelihoods and their lives at risk when they come forward um, uh, to reveal fraud. Now, as Mark pointed out, my experience was at the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, and while I was on that agency, there um, was, among other things, there were proposals that would have made the process for coming forward um, uh, uh, more uh, difficult, less certain, and um, in particular, more full of pitfalls that a whistleblower might step into as they um, considered coming forward. In particular, um, uh, the, uh, the, a proposal that was advanced uh, while I was on the commission um, um, uh, suggested uh, in some passages that whistleblowers who came forward um, and filed a report early before they uh, obtained uh, counsel and assistance with that process might later find themselves foreclosed by their previous reporting to the commission um, um, uh, 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 when they uh, tried to bring a whistleblower claim. They, the, the proposal also suggested uh, that awards for whistleblowers might uh, be subject to reductions um, uh, by political appointees at the agencies. Um, and I, I'm proud of many things um, that I did while I was a commissioner at the SEC. Um, but the thing I'm proudest of is having fought back against that proposal. Um, and the reason I'm proud of it, um, and I did that with the help of many people in this community and in this conversation, is because um, I tried very hard when I was a policymaker to put myself in the place of the people we are asking to help us um, uh, enforce the laws. And if you spend even a moment, I don't have the experience that my colleagues on this panel do, um, um, sitting with them and working through that process, but if you even for a moment imagine what it's like to ask somebody uh, to put their lives on the line um, uh, to help us um, have a better um, market uh, law and nation. Um, uh, if you think what you're really asking of them, what you must do is make it as easy as possible uh, for them to access the process, to be honest about what they've seen and why it's troubling, and to be compensated fairly for the risk that they took 
Um, and uh, what we'll talk about today, Mark, as you know, is the tools that are available at the SEC for doing that. Um, but I'm delighted to say that that proposal, which was made uh, well over a year ago, has not yet finalized those changes. Um, and I'm hopeful that we're going to persuade my, co my former colleagues on the commission um, to keep these things well in mind before they make any of those changes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. And we'll get an opportunity to talk a little bit more about that in questions and answers. Um, my great privilege to introduce Stephen Cohn, the co-founder and chairman of the board for the National Whistleblower Center. Um, he's rec widely recognized as the most impactful whistleblower attorney in the U.S. His research is what led to the rediscovery of America's first whistleblower law adopted 242 years ago today on July 30th, 1778. And if I just may say, I first met Steve in 1980, 40 years ago, and I've been a fan ever since. Stephen. Well, thank you, Mark. And uh, it's an honor to be here, an honor to be on this panel and to see people whom I know have worked so hard for protecting whistleblowers and human rights, and it's just great to be here. Uh, the I, I'm here to say about the tools for whistleblowers, and this is a very important message. They have improved. They have in some ways been re a, a revolution. So yes, we hear about retaliation, and it exists. And many of the whistleblower laws protecting employees from retaliation have been improved. But at the end of the day, you always lose. If, if you blow the whistle and are subject to retaliation, your name is known in the industry. You're going to get blacklisted. Even if your order is reinstated, your career path will be stalled. And we've lived through that for many years. To correct that injustice and to incentivize whistleblowers who are the most important source of fraud and fraud detection in the country and in the world, Congress has taken action. And these are the new tools and they're still not widely known. First, your right to report anonymously and confidentially has been significantly expanded. I have now been working with the SEC, the Department of Justice, and the Internal Revenue Service, and they have in case after case religiously protected the identity and confidentiality of the whistleblower to the point where my largest case ever, the company never even knew there was a whistleblower. So if you want to be protected and the, com and the company doesn't know who you are, you're pretty much not going to be retaliated against. This is a major advance. The second is payment of rewards. In the old days, and still in retaliation, you got paid if you won, but the amount of damage was how much you suffered. The more you suffered, the more you got. Who wanted to get a big judgment? Who wanted to have their careers destroyed for years or suffer severe emotional distress? The reward laws flipped that. Your compensation is based on the quality of your information and the ability to hold corrupt officials and wrongdoers accountable. You get a percentage of the successful prosecution. In other words, you're incentivized to come forward with the best information. You can do it anonymously and you can be compensated for the risks you are really taking. So these are the new tools, and, and it's very important for the entire whistleblower community to understand that these tools are effective and will work. Thank you, Mark, and everybody. Well, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. I, I'm impressed you kept it to three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, to round out this panel, we are so fortunate today to have Donna Boemi, the lion of compliance. She is an internationally recognized authority on organizational compliance and ethics. She has been recognized as a recipient 
of the 2014 Society of Corporate Compliance and Ethics International Award, the 2019 Honoree of Lifetime Achievement Award from Trust Across America, Trust Around the World. And just so fortunate and appreciate you joining us today, Donna. I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah. Um, hey, Donna, we can't quite hear you. I'm sorry. Take, take a look at your mute button. Donna, it's the top left can part. Yes, we yeah, can, we can you. hear you now, Donna. Okay. You. That's great. Thank you, Mark. It's an honor and a pleasure to be part of this learned panel and to celebrate uh, on this virtual conference, National Whistleblower Appreciation Day. Um, I think it's really important that every year um, we have this day to recognize and support the noble and important role of the whistleblower in our democracy, um, which has been that case since, uh, since this day in 1778. Um, I'd like to talk about the internal tools that are available to whistleblowers, uh, which really in most companies uh, today is the internal hotline or ethics line or helpline it might be called. Um, about, a, about a decade ago, when the SEC was considering their final rules for the Dodd-Frank whistleblower program, Steve asked me to speak to a number of the SEC commissioners about the linkage between corporate compliance, which has its tools to raise uh, whistleblower concerns up to, uh, to senior management so that those uh, problems can be taken care of. And I wanted to talk to the commissioners about the linkage between corporate compliance, which is where at first uh, most whistleblowers start, uh, and, uh, and the the program that they were considering. And I told each of the commissioners that if, if my own sister were asking me internally, should she call her helpline in her company because she had something she wanted to report, I told each of them that if my sister had asked me, I would have said, well, the most important thing you need to research is who is in charge of overseeing and managing that helpline program. Is it the general counsel and legal? Or is there an independent corporate compliance officer with experience and uh, subject matter expertise who knows what they're doing and has the independence and the empowerment to uh, manage that program? Because it's really the chief compliance officer and the compliance department's mandate to raise problems up to senior levels through uh, those that are raised on the helpline and in other means. And unfortunately, at that time, what I told the, the commissioners was that most corporate compliance programs did not work. They were broken because they were being run by legal. They were being covered by legal under the legal mandate to protect and defend the company, not the, not the compliance mandate, which is to find problems and fix problems and to prevent problems and bring them up to senior levels where they could be uh, fixed. And so that major tool, the helpline, which is where most whistleblowers start, is uh, problematic. And I told the commissioners, most corporate uh, programs are, are broken. And at that time that I said that, I think 80 to 90% of all corporate compliance programs were vested in the legal department and was run by uh, legal or somebody buried in legal. Um, there was one company where the helpline rang on the desk of the general counsel. Um, and I'm happy to say that today, because of the work of a lot of people in the compliance profession, um, that difference is now being understood and fewer and fewer uh, compliance programs are being run through legal. And the ones who are independent and the best programs are run by an independent chief compliance officer with experience and expertise. So that 
figure is from 80 to 90% down to almost, I think it's 41% last time I looked. Uh, so that is an important question when you are using the tool internally of the helpline, is to look carefully at the independence and empowerment of your compliance officer. How are they positioned? What's their seniority? And what is their experience? Thank, thank, thank you, Donna. I, I really appreciate the specificity by which you identified how uh, employees can uh, be, be able to determine if the corporate um, hotline is the right place to go. Um, what I'd like to do is go to questions um, for the panelists. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, our time is tight and my job is to keep us on schedule. So I'm gonna start with you, Robert. Um, I'd like you to talk about um, actually following up something that you said, why is it important for whistleblowers to seek advice of counsel before blowing the whistle? And particularly when it comes to the um, what attorneys can do to assist with the SEC whistleblower program and using the protections in Dodd-Frank Act? Uh, well, thank you, Mark. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer um, uh, directly and quickly. Um, I urge everybody out there who's thinking about um, coming forward and revealing what's troubling them and what they've seen um, to, um, uh, to use whistleblower counsel. Um, because the advice um, and guidance you get is invaluable in a process that we at the SEC are trying to make easier. We're trying to make more transparent, but still comes with all kinds of pitfalls, large and small, um, and um, uh, clear and hidden. Um, just to give one example, um, uh, when you engage uh, in an SEC, when you're considering an SEC whistleblower complaint, there are various stages at the process when you will actually come forward to the office at the SEC and share the details uh, of, of, of what you've seen. Um, the moment that you choose for that uh, for that revelation, the um, context in which it occurs, all of the different, um, the degree of um, evidence you're able to marshal at the beginning of that, all of those things um, are things that counsel have to understand well before um, the whistleblower engages with the agency. Um, and of course, Donna will be able to say more about the internal processes um, um, uh, that will have to uh, have informed that, uh, those decisions. So um, uh, especially at the commission, um, uh, if you're thinking about engaging with us, having the assistance of whistleblower counsel is really invaluable. Terrific, thank you very much, Robert. So, so, so Steve, what I wanna ask you is, you know, you've represented countless uh, whistleblowers in your career. What is the most important one thing that whistleblower, whistleblowers need to know if they want to see justice done and protect themselves from retaliation? Sure. Number one is to know your rights before you open your mouth. It's as simple as that. It's kind of comes back to the get good counsel, know what your rights are. It's a crazy world. Who you blow the whistle to can determine whether you have no rights at all or maybe can collect a million dollar award. Also, for example, anonymity. You blow the whistle even to the SEC on your own, you have no rights to be anonymous. But if you come in through a lawyer, you can be. So these very important initial steps and then also how you articulate your whistleblower concern can determine whether you're in or you're out. So, and the other problem is so you under so everyone understands it. There's no one whistleblower law. There's about 60 whistleblower laws covering all different segments of the economy. There's one for tax, one for securities, one for government fraud, one for tax evasion, one for money laundering. So unless you understand what you're blowing the whistle on and how to put the circle in the circle, you're in trouble. So know your rights. Okay, Steve, I think that was pretty clear. I had no idea myself that there were dozens and dozens of whistleblower laws. Um, so that, that, that makes a big difference. You gotta know which law applies to which situation, and that's why you need an experienced whistleblower attorney. Okay, so, so, so Donna, uh, I want to go back to corporate practices, and 
I want to talk about best practices for a minute, okay? And what are the one or two best corporate practices? You started talking about one earlier, but what are one or two other best corporate practices when it comes to protecting whistleblowers from retaliation? And which companies do you think are taking the lead in promoting whistleblower disclosures, you know, having, you know, model policies? Okay. Well, I think that one of the most important things that companies can do to professionalize their whistleblower program is to have guidelines that are uh, clear on certain areas that make the whistleblower program effective. So it would be those guidelines would cover independence, would cover uh, lack of conflict of interest, confidentiality, non-retaliation, and professionalism. Uh, so we created in one of my earlier SECO uh, jobs a model set of whistle of uh, investigation guidelines because we noticed that so many uh, investigations were being handled by people who had no experience and really were just winging it. So you got former law enforcement, FBI, uh, former auditors, and security personnel with no uh, experience, and they were um, managing investigations in a way that you know they maybe watched on TV uh, on Columbo or something and uh, and we did not have a consistent and professional way to protect our whistleblowers and to raise the complaint steadily and fairly to the right people who could resolve it and so one of the best things I think companies can do and one of the things I ask when I go in to assess companies is what are your uh, investigation guidelines and what kind of training do you have for the people that lead investigations? That's really important. So uh, now your next question is, uh, what companies are, are doing this well? Well, I've, I've, been, you know, I've, I've evaluated a lot of companies. I will say that a number of uh, financial institutions uh, do have some investigation guidelines and professional training in place because they know how serious it is to get their um, their ducks in a row with respect to whistleblowers and protect them and make them feel confident to come forward if they've got a concern. Uh, and so, and I'll say that uh, that uh, Novartis is another company that is taking great strides in many respects, and some other healthcare companies as well, because again, it's very critical to their underlying business to make sure that they are aware of any problems before those problems explode. Um, so they, I will tell you that I'll say, do, I'll flip it and say the three biggest scandals that we know of, which are examples of companies that failed, companies that knew about these problems internally for years, sometimes a decade, and never fixed them, are GM with its uh, delayed uh, uh, initial switch recall, where over 100 people died. Uh, the um, uh, and uh, G, GM and uh, see, VW with their uh, emissions cheating scandal, the software, they knew about that for at least a decade. Uh, people had tried to come forward, but they were never listened to and the investigation went awry. And the third would be Wells Fargo, where the problems were known for many years and people who called what they called the ethics line were routinely fired, called in and fired for raising the concern. Uh, and so they could have gotten ahead of that had they known about it. They could have managed it, but they did not. So that's an example of companies that have completely failed. I mean, what we have today on this panel that is so significant is three prongs of whistleblower compliance. What we have is the advocacy represented by Steve Cohn to represent whistleblowers and do the lit litigation. We've got Robert Jackson, who's representing the regulatory um, strategy of how to regulate companies. And then we have Donna, who's on the inside, who is pushing corporations into voluntary compliance. And really, we need all three to work together to be able to be successful. And that's what 
I feel is very unique about this particular panel that was put together. I um, really apologize that we don't have time for more questions, that um, my job is to make sure that we stay on time. I want to thank each of you for your comments and for all of the work that you have done and all of the work that you are going to continue to do. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. John? Thank you, Mark. And this happy you. Thank you so much. I think this panel was fantastic, and I'm grateful to all of you. I'm grateful to everyone who participated in this conference, both panelists, speakers, and the attendees. If you're like me, you're saying, wow, you touched on issues of great complexity, and we did not give it nearly enough time. Well, I have two suggestions on that front, and then we're going to wrap it up. One is you'll be getting an email in the next couple of days uh, from the conference organizers uh, with recordings of these uh, presentations. So go back uh, and uh, you know pick out some of the speakers that you wanted to hear more from and listen to what they have to say. Feel free to follow up with them. Uh, the other thing is go to the uh, National Whistleblower website or check us out on social media. We've got a lot of educational resources. Um, we have an action network if you want to help. If you were inspired today, which I hope you were, and you want to help get stronger whistleblower protections, uh, we use our uh, action network list to uh, make significant progress on policy by letting uh, members of Congress and other key policymakers know that there's a, a public that cares deeply about the subject. So uh, go to our website, sign up for the action site, uh, engage with us on social media. We'd love to be in conversation with our supporters and uh, look forward to staying in touch with all of you and uh, we'll be back next year hopefully in person but perhaps uh, virtually again and uh, look we're finishing on time very proud of that uh, and thanks again and happy national whistleblower day